Good evening, friends and neighbors. How are you doing tonight? That was a lukewarm. It was lukewarm. Uh, and I don't want to assume that you're not doing well, so I'll say it again. Good evening, friends and neighbors. How are you doing tonight? Oh, that's, that's much better. Thank you. It, was, it is a great pleasure to welcome uh, this evening's speaker um, as a part of the Emancipation uh, Exhibition, Dr. Francis Jones Sneed. And I asked Francis to send me what she would like to be said about her because I prefer to introduce people with the words and thoughts that they would like to have shared. So here are Frances' reflections on herself. Frances Jones Sneed is a professor emeritus of history at the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts, otherwise known as MCLA, in North Adams, Massachusetts. She has taught and researched local history for over 30 years. She directed three National Endowment for the Humanities, NEH grants, and has spearheaded a national conference on African American biography. She is co-director of the Upper Housatonic Valley African American Heritage Trail and co-editor of the Upper Housatonic African American Her Heritage Trail Guide. Frances is a former board member of the Mass Humanities and the W.E.B. Du Bois Freedom Center. She is a member of the Samuel Harrison Society, the MCLA Foundation, and the W.E.B. Du Bois Society. She is a 2008 NEH Summer Fellow at the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute at Harvard University and a 2022 Governor's Awardee for Humanities. She is currently editing the autobiography of the Reverend Samuel Harrison, a monograph about blacks in New England, and a K through 16 curriculum guide on W.E.B. Du Bois, The Souls of Black Folks. As you can see, this is a person who's deeply engaged in scholarship and research and reflecting on history, not only of our geographic area, but also national history, because W.E.B. Du Bois is a national figure of great historical importance. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Frances Jones Sneed. Thank you very much for uh, that gracious uh, introduction, Sandra. <clears throat> no one could do it better than you, you know. Um, and I want to thank WICMA, the staff of WICMA, for inviting me to do this presentation. Um, I think Sandra had something to do with that as well. Uh, what Sandra hasn't, uh, what she didn't tell, and the reason why uh, she is, uh, she works here um, as the um, director of the dance program here at Williams, but. Uh, we are friends, and so <laughs> that's one of the reasons I think that uh, she was asked to introduce me so that I wouldn't be uh, upset with anybody else. Uh, I would just <laughs> be upset with Sandra. <laughs> um, so thank you very much, and I, I thank Wigma for uh, inviting me to do this presentation. Um, and I am just awed, and I hope that all of you have had a chance to go and see the exhibition upstairs, because I'm an I'm in awe about the amazing exhibition and the brilliant artists and curators who created it. Um, their vision and the way that they have put this together about emancipation uh, of what we should be doing right here and right now, I think is really, really great. I also want to take this time to thank some people in the audience who uh, have supported me. Um, because when you do research uh, of any kind, you're never alone. Uh, in this uh, whole venture, you take with you a village, I believe, a, a, a kind of academic village. And my, uh, my friend, my colleague, my buddy, Sue Denault, is sitting back there in the audience. And uh, I've known Sue since my, the beginning of my tenure at uh, MCLA. Uh, Sue is a, um, 
I call her a librarian. She's really a local researcher. Uh, uh, just um, she does everything, and I never do a project without calling Sue up. I know she's tired of me. I, def I never pay any money to do it, so uh, <laughs> uh, I hope she's interested in and 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 the same things that I'm interested in because um, I call her so much. But thank you, Sue, uh, for all you do uh, for for the research that we do on African American history. Um, I also want to thank uh, all of the writers and researchers who've worked with me for the last 25 years in doing the research here in Berkshire County, including the late uh, Emily Piper, uh, David Levinson, Bernard Drew, uh, Don Morin, who was one of my fa uh, former students. I also like to thank uh, Tiffany Wu, who helped me with the uh, PowerPoint presentation because uh, I'm a little rusty with that. I, uh, I would, I'm hoping that uh, there will be something different coming up rather than PowerPoint, you know, and I was thinking, I'm doing a PowerPoint presentation and I'm doing it in, a, in an art museum, right? So I can't have any fuzzy pictures, you know, like, you know, they are not, you know, focused a little bit. So I really wanted to do well. So Tiffany helped me out in that way. And I want to thank uh, Francis, Chloe Jones Whitman for helping me with the little graphs that you'll see there. She introduced me to Canva, and uh, so it's it's something that I'm learning as well. As you get older, and I say Perot, you always need something to stimulate the little gray cells, and uh, so I'm I'm really really glad that I have young people like Tiffany and and Francis Chloe to help me out uh, to kind of do that. So. Enough of that then. Um, but the questions that the artists pose in this exhibition that I hope all of you've seen are questions, eternal questions that all Americans should be considering at this moment. They are the questions that Creed the Corps ask in the infancy of this nation and Nina Simone ask in the 1960s. What does it mean to be an American? What does it mean to be free? There are also other questions, particularly um, connected with this exhibition and this topic that we should be asking ourselves. What do we know about the early part of Berkshire County, the place in which we live? Who were the people who lived here? And what were their views on emancipation before the proclamation? And after the proclamation, what did they think about that? What is the impact of that legacy, and why should we care about it in the 21st century? But before the Emancipation Proclamation, there were two other documents that black people thought gave them the chance for freedom and citizenship in this country. The Declaration of Independence. You see how awful I am with this. The Constitution, and so the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Emancipation Proclamation are three of the most important documents in American history. Some feel that if one clause had not been deleted from the Declaration of Independence, history of race and race relations in this country would be different. Both the Declaration and the Constitution skirted the real issues of slavery and therefore, the issue was still a glaring defect that led to the Civil War and the unequal America that we live in today. Although the Constitution does not mention the word slave or slavery, there are four clauses that we know that speak directly to it. Skipping ahead to 1860 and the election of Abraham Lincoln, when the slave states felt the tide of public opinion turning against them, they succeeded from the Union. Lincoln and the Union reacted by going to war to preserve the Union for that Constitution that was ratified in 1787. But before any of these documents, there was Berkshire County. It was a county settled by the English in Massachusetts because of the proximity to the uh, French frontier, its native population, 
and its geographic terrain. A 17th century English traveler described the southern portion of the county as very woody, rocky, mountainous, and swampy. A hideous, howling wilderness. Well, at the time of the earliest European settlement in the Berkshires, the hilly and heavily wooded area was sparsely populated by Native people, primarily the Mohicans. The earliest known European inhabitants of the Berkshire probably would have been Dutch, filtering over from what we now know as New York State. Blacks came as early settlers with the Dutch and the British, while others came as free people or escaped slaves. Berkshire County occupies the western extremity of the state and is bounded on the north by Vermont, on the east by Franklin, Hampshire, and Hamden counties, on the south by Connecticut, and on the west by New York. It has an area of about 1,000 square miles. It is home to about 110,000 resident presently, and it spans 30 miles east to west and 60 miles north to south. It is commonly referred to as three sections, north, central, and south counties. Traditionally, people born in one section spend their entire lives never traveling to any other areas of the county. We are very parochial, right? <laughs> When the first census, uh, federal census was taken in 1790, there were about 31,000 inhabitants in the county. About 10% were Native people, and less than 3% were black. Just wanted to show you that, you know, how we're positioned in the state, you know. The farthest west that you can get, right in the corner, right? No wonder, we, uh, you know, some people uh, after the Revolutionary War wanted to secede from Massachusetts and go over to New York because they felt more like that they were in New York than they were in Massachusetts. That's the way I felt when I first came here. I mean, I heard all of the news from Albany and, uh, and uh, WAMC and all of the news that were going on there. I heard nothing from Boston, you know? Where is that place that we're supposed to be connected to? It's isolating, and it was isolated then, the last place that was settled, and we still feel like stepchildren in Massachusetts with all, any kind of legislation and anything that happens. And just kind of getting from the furthest north to the furthest south as a resident of the county takes, a, takes some effort, you know? So I've been thanked many times for appearing in Great Barrington often uh, because it takes sometimes about an hour and 15 minutes to get down there according to wh what's happening with the roads. And these are the, there and it's all of our little towns. We have two cities, Pittsville, the major city that a lot of us don't want to go to because we are really afraid of what's happening in Pittsville. It's okay, they're, they're pretty nice folk. And then North Adams is the other city that we have. Of course, the southern part of Berkshire County was uh, inhabited by uh, Europeans first um, because it was easier to kind of get there. And, so, and then we go all, all the way up and finally uh, Williamstown. Of course, um, Fort, uh, a fort was built uh, for t protection, which was uh, immediately burned down by the natives. And so we had to run back south again to kind of for, for protection. But the point is that we're pretty hemmed in. We have very few people, and we're very pretty hemmed in uh, in, in the area that we are. So the population by the United States, this is my Canva uh, thing, I'm really proud of that. If I was really cool, I would have it as a link that I could actually click on, you could actually see the actual numbers, but I'm not that cool yet. But you can see the discrepancy between blacks and whites 
in the United States from 1790 all the way up to 2020. Massachusetts, little less so, right? It goes up starting in the 2000s, the population of the black population goes up a little bit. But still, there are not in the state a lot of blacks. Berkshire County. It's almost a even wave, right? <laughs> We're just sitting there, right? Well, uh, we started uh, with that 31,000 you know, population. Uh, we're about 2,500 people now, presently, um, in the state. The point is, the significant point, that the black population in the Berkshires has, at its highest, been only about 3%. But the significant impact of those 3% of those people with what they have done and what they have accomplished over time is phenomenal. That's my point, okay? So the first stirrings of the American Revolution emerged here in the Berkshires with the Sheffield Declaration in 1773. And several dozen blacks served among them, and one of them was Agrippa Hall of Stockbridge, who influenced the Polish general on liberty, freedom, and justice. Agrippa was born to free parentage. There he is. In the Pioneer Valley in Northampton in 1759. Not much is known about his parents' origin, though he claimed that his father was an African prince. I'm not going against that. We do know that they were among a very few blacks in the area at that time. They settled down to farming, a small plot that was disrupted during the French and Indian War, and afterwards his father died. In Massachusetts as a whole, blacks made up less than 2% of the population at that time, most laboring on the seaport docks facing the Atlantic or on coastal vestals. In western Massachusetts, the Berkshires, along the Connecticut and Housatonic rivers, not even one of every hundred settlers were black. After his father's death, his mother was unable to maintain the farm and support the family, like many widows in her time. She sent her seven-year-old son to live with black friends in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. Living on their 50-acre farm on Evergreen Hill, just across the Housatonic River, Job and Rose Benny provided Agrippa what his mother could not, security, education, and a stable family environment. Stockbridge at that time was a beautiful place, different with low mountains, fertile soils, and access to the Housatonic River. But more unusual, Stockbridge was mostly an Indian town where only a few dozen white families and four free black families lived among several hundred Mohicans, Wappingtons, and Mohawk Indians. They were the remnants of larger tribes that had been devastated by disease and war. When he was 18 years of age, war, the Revolutionary War, came to the Berkshires in terms of forming a militia, and Agrippa joined the local militia. The muster master for Berkshire County wrote out a terse description of Agrippa at that point in time. He said he was five feet seven inches, black complexion, and woolly hair. We can see that, right? <coughs> Hall served two generals in the Revolutionary War for a total of six years, almost the full length of the war. But it was with the second general, the Polish Thaddeus Kosciuszko, that would impact Hull for the rest of his life. More importantly, Hull would influence this man to reassess his thinking on the meaning of liberty and freedom. Through his acquaintance with Hull, Kosciuszko was convinced that slavery was wrong and thus tried to convince his friend, Thomas Jefferson, 
to manumit his slaves through a generous bequest to Jefferson in his will. Hall would maintain a relationship with Casa Cusco long after the war. And when he returned to Berkshire County, he brought with him stories of the war. He became the favorite storyteller of Stockbridge. He and his wife attended the Congregational Church, and he worked as a butler for Theodore Sedgwick and became the largest black landowner in Berkshire County. He was an extraordinary man with a sharp wit. Stockbridge's early historian recalled how Agrippa and the man that he was serving at that point in time, who was probably Sedgwick, were attending the same church services when a distinguished mulatto preacher, who was probably Lemuel Haynes, gave the sermon for the day. On coming out of the church, the gentleman with, uh, said to Agrippa, well, how do you like that inward preaching? Sir, he promptly retorted, he was half black and he was half white. I like my half. Did you like yours? <laughs> Agrippa, through his humanity, influenced some of the leading men of his day to reconsider the moral of enslavement and to think about freedom as something that should be open for all men. His friend Elizabeth Freeman of Sheffield pioneered the fight against slavery and her 1871 lawsuit contributed to Massachusetts' decision to abolish the practice statewide. In 1780, the proclamation, all men are born free and equal, rang out in the small town of Sheffield. The line was from the state's newly ratified constitution, read aloud for a proud public to hear. America's war for independence was raging, and like the wretched of the burgeoning country, the town was gripped by revolutionary fever. But one woman who had heard it wasn't inspired. She was enraged. Elizabeth Freeman, then known only as Bet, was an enslaved woman who understood the irony in the declaration right away. And as she watched the men around her declare freedom, she asked herself, why not freedom for myself? She marched by all accounts to the house of Theodore Sedgwick, a local attorney, and demanded, demanded that she wanted to sue the state of Massachusetts for her freedom. She said, I heard that paper read yesterday that says, all men are born equal and that every man has a right to freedom. She said, I'm not a dumb critter. Won't the law give me my freedom? She made a surprising argument, and Cedric agreed to represent her. Her trial the following year became what has been called the trial of the century, rocking not only Massachusetts, but the entire institution of slavery. Massachusetts occupied an odd place in the history of slavery. <clears throat> it was the first colony to legalize the practice and the residents of the states were active in the slave trade. What it made it different, however, was that the state law recognized enslaved people as both property and as persons, which meant they could prosecute the men who owned them, requiring that they prove lawful ownership. By 1780, almost 30 enslaved people in the state had sued for their freedom on a basis of a variety of technicalities, such as a reneged promise of freedom or an illegal purchase. Friedman's case, however, was different. She didn't seek her freedom through a loophole, but instead called into account the existence of slavery itself, which affected uh, an estimated 2.2% of Massachusetts population at that point in time. The series of legal challenges to slave owners is evidence that a battle was brewing in the state and that freedom or that Freeman may not have been acting in isolation. In fact, some historians believe that she was deliberately selected as a sympathetic test case to end slavery in Massachusetts. Freeman was a nurse and a midwife. She was widely known throughout the area 
And unlike many enslaved women at that point in time, she traveled and came into regular contact with hundreds of white people. Details about freemen who could not read or write are hard to come by. But from what we know and the documents that do exist, it shows that she was spoken of in glowing terms by the people she worked for and the people that she knew. Freeman was enslaved in the house of John Ashley, who was a prominent judge in Sheffield. And from 1746 until her court case in 1781, she lived in the Ashley household. Like Sedgwick, Ashley was a man of his time. He spent his days agitating against the British rule while participating in the slave trading and slave holding himself. Ashley's wife had a reputation of being extremely cruel. And one day her anger at an enslaved girl named Lizzie boiled over. She ripped an iron shovel out of the oven and raised it above her head, poised to bring it crashing down upon Lizzie, who most historians believe was either Freeman's daughter or her sister. But Freeman threw herself in front of Lizzie, absorbing the blow. Red hot from the coals, the shovel sliced so deep into Freeman's arm that it hit bone. She would carry the scar for the rest of her life, but would later point out, Madam never again laid her hand on Lizzie. When asked to explain the wound that she refused to cover, her reply was, ask Madam. Being enslaved in the Ashley household meant freedom. Freeman had a front row seat to the revolution, which likely informed what she did later on in her own rebellion. In early 1773, about eight years before Freeman's court case, 11 of Sheffield's wealthiest and most influential white men gathered in Ashley's upstairs room to draft their grievances and decry British tyranny. Resentments against British rule had begun to bubble over ever since the Boston Tea Party. The man chosen to pen the statement was Theodore Sedgwick, who would go on not only to represent Freeman, but also to become a state senator, speaker of the House, and a member of the Massachusetts Supreme Court. The Sheffield Declaration outlined grievances like unfair taxation, but they also included some of the language of the Declaration of Independence, which would be written three years later, including that all men are equal, free, and independent, and have a right to undisturbed enjoyment of their lives, their liberty, and their property. By some account, Freeman was in that very room where the documents were being drafted, serving the men as they dreamed of freedom. And she said her most famous quote that we know that comes down to us from Catherine Sedgwick, one of the children of Theodore Sedgwick, that Elizabeth Freeman, um, quote unquote, raised. She said, any time, any time while I was a slave, if one minute's freedom had been offered to me, and I had been told that I must die at the end of that minute, I would have taken it just to stand one minute on God's earth, a free woman, I would. This is a person who really, really wanted their freedom. She was active in the pursuit of her own freedom. And it's not unusual at this time because there's documented history that there were many enslaved persons using the legal system to resist here in Massachusetts. One slave, enslaved man, Quack Walker, was already in the throes of a legal battle when Freeman was gearing up for her suit. Walker had uh, been inherited uh, by a man who owned him. And when he died, he was passed over to his widow. But Walker claimed that they had promised him his freedom when he was 25 years of age. But by the time the enslaver had died, he was 28. And so he just simply walked away. They caught him and beat him. And then he sued 
for assault and battery, claiming that they did not own him. Eventually, he would win his suit and, would, and they would be forced to pay damages to him. But Freeman's case was a much more radical case. She wasn't only saying that her enslavement was unjust, she was saying that all enslavement was unjust. It was, wasn't just radical, it was effective. A jury of 12 local farmers in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, all men and all white, ruled in favor of Freeman in 1781, giving her her freedom and awarding her 30 shillings in damage. I must say, I say here that the case is called Brum and Bet versus Ashley. And the reason it is, is that women didn't have the right at that point in time to bring suit. Um, and so she needed a male attached to, so they got uh, a male who was enslaved in the same household to join her, uh, whose name was Brum, and that's the reason why the court case is, is that way. The first thing that she did was to change her name, casting off her slave name in favor of one that celebrated her new status. The name Freeman is, um, you will see it if you go to the 1870 uh, manuscript census record, you will see a lot of formerly enslaved people with that last name, <clears throat> that they chose the name Freeman because they were free at that point in time. Her case, along with the Walkers, was a death knell for slavery in Massachusetts. In 1790, according to the federal census, Massachusetts no longer had any slaves, which made it the first state to, comp to comprehensively abolish slavery. And that's because of Elizabeth Freeman. Freeman went on to work for the Cedrics, becoming, by her own account, a trusted member of the family. Her prominence in the community as a midwife grew, and she outlined in her will what she left was including a house, 20 acres of land, $300, and a long list of possession. To say this was unusual for a black woman at that time would be an understatement. When she died in 1829, around the age of eight, 85, hundreds attended her funeral. Now, um, Sue and I and, and some of our students start to look at um, these people 20, 25 years ago. And um, at that point in time, Quark Walker was in uh, uh, the national textbooks. I remember when I grew up talking about enslavement. Um, and I don't know about you guys. You looked in your uh, high school uh, history textbook. Quark Walker was uh, credited with the uh, end of slavery uh, in Massachusetts. But in the last 10 to 15 years, guess who is now appearing in textbooks? Elizabeth Freeman. <laughs> uh, and not only that, she has a statue, a prominent statue, in the National Museum of African American History in Washington, D.C. I walked around the corner when I first visited and ran into Elizabeth Freeman and gasped. <laughs> at that time, the crowds wanting to see um, the exhibits at the National Museum were so large, we were like sardines packed in there. And so there was somebody in front of me, somebody in back of me, and so I couldn't stop for long. So I was gasping, and the, and the man behind me said, do you want to take your picture? And I said, yes. And so there I am standing in front of the Elizabeth Freeman statue in the National Museum in Washington, D.C., this woman from Berkshire County. I was so proud. Last summer, or was it the summer before last? I'm old, so old I forget my time here. In Sheffield, they have now also erected a statue of Elizabeth Freeman. And so our own Berkshire County is now also honoring Elizabeth Freeman in, in some way. But some 80 years plus before the Emancipation Proclamation, Hull and Freeman demonstrated that what freedom really meant and accomplished a death knell to slavery in Massachusetts, but there were still four million other enslaved persons 
to emancipate. And so 1863, with the uh, coming of the Emancipation Proclamation, was really an anticipated day. Blacks, white abolitionists, and Republican representatives in large cities such as New York, Philadelphia, and Boston waited with bated breath for the official release of the document called the Emancipation Proclamation that President Abraham Lincoln had unveiled as a preliminary document in 1862. There was a flurry of behind the scenes politics to assure that the president would keep his word and release the document. Once released, there was great celebration and jubilee as William Lloyd Garrison described in his newspaper, The Liberator, on January 2nd, 1863. Glory, hallelujah, the grand demonstration in the city. Yesterday at Tremont Temple, probably the only public celebration of its, this kind in this section of the country. The proclamation of freedom was not received at the meeting until just previous to the adjournment last evening. The joyous enthusiasm manifested was beyond description. The whole audience rising to their feet and shouting to their top of their voice, glory, hallelujah. Frederick Douglass on the occasion wrote, can any colored man or any white man, friendly to the freedom of all men, ever forget that night which followed the first day of January 1863 when the world was to see if Abraham Lincoln would prove to be as good as his word. I shall never forget that memorable night when in a distant city I waited and watched at a public meeting with 3,000 others not less anxious than myself for the word of deliverance which we have read here today. And I shall never forget the outburst of joy and thanksgiving that rent the air when the lightning brought to us the Emancipation Proclamation. In that happy hour, we forgot all delay and forgot all tardiness, forgot that the president had bribed the rebels to lay down their arms by promise to withhold the boat, which would smite the slave system with destruction. And we were thenceforward willing to allow the president all the latitude of time, phraseology, and every honorable device that statesmanship might require for the achievement of a great and beneficent measure of liberty and progress. There's a, I, I don't talk a lot about Mr. Lincoln here. And from the um, black point of view, Mr. Lincoln was an instrument here. Uh, and he was pushed and cajoled uh, to do what he did. Although, historically, when we look back, it's, it was probably the greatest thing that Abraham Lincoln did under his administration was the issuing of the Emancipation Proclamation. And we always say in 101 history class, wonder what would have happened had Lincoln lived? How would the country have fared if it hadn't had an Andrew Johnson? Uh, at the helm at that point in period of time. We don't need to. Have. But a local Berkshire response from one of the local papers here was similar to some of the national things that they were outraged at the president, that he would issue such a proclamation and allow enslaved people to be freed in a war that was not about slavery, but was about the saving of the Union. He wrote, the greatest crime ever committed by a chief magistrate of a free people has been perpetuated by the president of this Emancipation Proclamation. The abolition scheme, unconstitutional, partisan, and atrocious in itself cannot do any good, but is sure to produce immense harm to the cause of the Union at home and abroad. And only those who are blind to the most patent facts and deaf to all appeals of reason and patriotism can doubt it. That was a portion of the uh, population um, of the Union who was, not, um, who was not part of the Confederacy. Of course, the Confederacy didn't like it. And in fact, um, Douglas talks about that 
Lincoln gave them in the preliminary um, emancipation a chance to, you know, be, uh, to sell off their slaves or to, you know, the federal government would give them money to uh, manumit their slaves. But they said no. And they buckled down even harder. But in the Berkshires, there was a wonderful occasion in a small black church on First Street in Pittsfield where the Reverend Samuel Harrison and his congregation invited guests and abolitionists from the area to celebrate the day. They became actively involved in publicly discussing the significance and future prospects of the proclamation, holding lectures and sermons and discussions. The Reverend Harrison's pastors of the uh, Pittsfield Second Congregational Church invited a, a speaker from Ghent, New York to give an address entitled, The President's Proclamation of Emancipation and the New Responsibilities of the Colored People. Reverend Harrison also went to uh, Troy, New York, giving his own lectures, and he tried to influence, he did influence uh, many black men to join the new 54th Regiment raised in Massachusetts, which began in February. They opened an office in Pittsfield, and the Eagle, the a newspaper at the time, said that it was an excellent opportunity for our colored citizens to refute the slanders who say that they have not the pluck to become soldiers. Their recruiting efforts was tremendous. And the Eagle reporter who visited the office said that the volunteers signed up were just going you know, one by one. He said, they do not look like men who would easily be frightened. All of them knew that the proclamation was just a beginning for the crusade for freedom and equal rights. We know that after the issue of the uh, proclamation that the 54th did, uh, Massachusetts 54th did go to fight, fought valiantly uh, at Fort Wagner with almost 300 of the 54th, the black men were killed uh, in that assault uh, along with their leader. Uh, Colonel Shaw. Um, I know many of you probably have seen the St. Gaudens uh, statue in, in Boston uh, about that. But the proclamation also brought out a lot of anger in the North that among the cruel and barbarous act of the, mo of the mob was a slaughter of colored people in New York City. In the evening, a newspaper report that they saw a poor Negro hanging by the neck on a tree. He was entirely naked and a slow fire burning under him. His feet were partially roasted, his body scorched in several places and lifeless. A crowd of people, men, women, and children were looking on. Rude boys were poking the poor corpse with sticks. And so the country was in the midst of a brutal civil war and the enslaved people thought that this was a momentous occasion for them. They longed for their freedom for years, and now it seemed that it was finally within their reach. They celebrated in the streets, singing and dancing, thanking President Lincoln for his bold action. Yet many were cautious, knowing that too much jubilation might bring forth a mob in opposition, as was demonstrated in New York. So they worked methodically and carefully. At the outset of the Civil War, many free black men were willing to fight in the conflict, but they were barred because of 1792 things which said that only able-bodied white men could join a militia. Congress repealed that law in 1862, and so they could no longer keep black men from serving in the war, and certainly the valor of the soldiers of the 54th at Fort Wagner showed them that they, were, that they could fight. But while they were there, they had another problem, that of equal pay. They refused to pay them the same salary as other soldiers. So what hope could they have in realizing their dreams if the government could not support them on equal pay? 
This is where Samuel Harrison, the Reverend Samuel Harrison, becomes our hero and wonder about the emancipation. This is the way he works. That he, with Governor Andrew and with Frederick Douglass, appealed all the way to Abraham Lincoln to make sure that equal pay was for all soldiers. We go to the Library of Congress and we find half a dozen documents between Governor Andrew and the Secretary of War and with Mr. Lincoln, specifically about Samuel Harrison and his, the way that he wanted to, to look at uh, pay because he went into um, the 54th as their chaplain. And as a chaplain, the chaplain is an officer. And so the officers were supposed to get $100 a month and two rations a day. But when he asked for it, when he went to the pay sergeant, the paymaster said, we denied him. In fact, he says, um, he wrote uh, about it, the paymaster did, quote, Samuel Harrison, chaplain of the 54th Resident Massachusetts Volunteers Colored Troops, asked pay at the usual rates, $100 per month and two rations, which he being of African descent, I declined playing under act of Congress passed July 17, 1862, employing person of African descent in military service of the United States, the chaplain declines to receive anything less. So Harrison refused that pay, and so did the enlisted soldiers, because where white soldiers were being paid $13 and getting an allowance for their clothing, black soldiers were get, only getting 10 with no allowances for clothing. So not only did Harrison, but all of the troops decided not to take any money whatsoever for their service until it was changed. Governor Andrew, known as um, the abolitionist governor of the state, um, wrote um, to um, Edward Bates, who was the Attorney General, and even he wanted, Governor Andrew wanted to uh, make up the difference from state funds, but the soldiers said no. It had to be the federal government who paid them because if they accepted it from the state, that still meant that they were less than men and they wanted to make sure that they did it. So finally it was reversed, but when it was reversed, they only paid soldiers who were free as of 1861. So not including any of those soldiers who had been free, who, uh, who joined, uh, who had come as a part of the Emancipation were freed as part of the Emancipation Proclamation. Any of those men who had been runaways and joined, none of those soldiers were to be paid and so they had to try to get that straight. So this was a slap in the face uh, that the Emancipation Proclamation meant nothing if they were gonna be second class citizenship. By the wars in pay equity uh, had been implemented and a large measure of political economic uh, equality seemed promised. But African Americans who came to be included in the Union Army as soldiers understood the meaning of just what it meant for them to fight for their cause of ending slavery. They believed that this would be a vital step towards acceptance and equality in a society that had long denied them their rights. But in the Civil War, more blacks from this area from the Berkshires, more blacks enlisted in the 54th than anywhere else in the state. I think Boston uh, contributed 27 black men. The Berkshires contributed 33. We know that there were a lot more black men in the Boston area <laughs> than in the Berkshires, right? Of whether it was Reverend Harrison or the recruiting agencies or rather these men themselves, but it was through their own agency that they wanted to be a part of this freedom in some way. In the 20th century, and I forgot about my slides here. That's beautiful, Douglas. <laughs> That's Reverend Samuel Harrison. The public opinion for and against the Emancipation Proclamation, which was about the same nationally as it was locally. 
the areas covered by the emancipation and those areas not covered. The famed 54th Troop. And in the 20th century, I say that this whole work of emancipation goes on through the efforts of a man called James Vandersee, who was born in Lenox and became the preeminent photographer for the Harlem Renaissance. And what Vandersee did is he made African Americans human, the humanistic side of that great migration of those blacks coming to the cities, the beautiful photographs. If you see any photographs of the Harlem Renaissance, it's probably one of James Vandersee's. And of course, I could go nowhere without talking about W.E.B. James Vandersee brought his photographic skills to depict the people of Harlem in a humanistic way. James Weldon Johnson wrote the words, who wrote the words of the Negro National Anthem, Summered and Alford, and Frank Grant of Williamstown made his mark in professional baseball. But the loudest voice for African American equality was W.E.B. Du Bois of Great Barrington the father of the modern civil rights movement, who single-handedly awakened America's understanding of the Reconstruction period and what the meaning of freedom was actually. He challenged and clarified what it means to be an American and what it means to be free. In the end, the Emancipation Proclamation paved the way for the eventual abolition of slavery in the United States. It inspired generations of civil rights activists and remains one of the most critical documents in American history. But as we celebrate the legacy of the Emancipation Proclamation today, we have to remember the brave men and women who fought for their freedom, and we honor for their courage and for taking a stand for doing what was right at that point and period of time. Just some names of some other representative African Americans in the area that is included in the uh, book uh, of the Upper Housatonic African American History Guide that is upstairs in uh, part of the uh, books that you can kind of look through when you go up there. And we're continually adding names uh, to, uh, uh, to this. So the legacy of Du Bois and Van Der Zee that we just talked about, I thought it would be interesting to look at the 21st century. Yeah. Um, some, some people who are, are still living, you know, and still trying to do good work for emancipation. Um, and I don't know if you know who these people are, and if you don't, you should find out. <laughs> uh, but Emancipation, the Unfinished Project of Liberation, which is the title of this exhibit, is true. And what does it mean to be free in 21st century Berkshire County? And what are we doing to further the work of emancipation in our own lives? Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Thanks, Gerald. <laughs> One of my old colleagues, just make, make, make sure that I saw him. <laughs> Any questions, comments? Yes. Um, yes, I have a broad spectrum question for you. I've been thinking within recent months and even in the past year about um, the strident the strident division that exists now. And when you had the three documents as being the most important, we had the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, essentially, which supports the Declaration of Independence, and the Emancipation Proclamation, which is embraced by both of those documents. Mm -hmm. But the Declaration of Independence proclaimed 
an emancipation for those people who came from Europe mm -hmm. here. And so the fact that they had people enslaved and couldn't tear, couldn't recognize in their own consciousness that they had done the same kind of thing and performed the same kind of freedom activation that the slaves were trying to do. I don't, I am trying to wrap my head around that concept. A lot of us are, right? Mm -hmm. We still are, yeah? But African Americans have taken these documents and they reinterpret it for themselves. And they turned around and put it back in the faces of our quote unquote founding fathers. And so even though it was not about quote unquote African Americans, just like what Elizabeth Friedman said, hey, you said all men and I'm not a dumb creature. So that must mean me. And so we've been reinterpreting these documents for ourselves. You know, the 14th Amendment, you know, one of the Reconstructions has been one of the best amendments around for not only African Americans, but all people who were not included in the whole pie. If you just go back and kind of look at who, who can be inclusive at this point period of time. And so we don't care what they meant. We know what we mean, and that's the way we're going to look at it. And, and, and that has been the kind of revolutionary kind of way that people like African Americans, like all of the oppressed, have kind of looked at, at the whole situation. So, any other questions, comments? Yes. <clears throat> yeah, I just want to piggyback on what you, you said there, you know, <clears throat> how we interpret uh, freedom and what it means to us, and never mind what these other people meant. But when you look at the founding documents of Massachusetts before it became Massachusetts, um, there's a document called, I always have to look, just looked it up to get the name right, the Massachusetts um, Body of Liberties. Mm -hmm. It's a document that establishes slavery in Massachusetts but it establishes slavery by saying there will be no slavery here amongst us. For years I've even taught that, that document and that statement uh, in context of other things and I didn't realize that the key word is amongst us. us. Mm -hmm. They didn't have slavery, it's a liberation document amongst white people, people. Mm -hmm. in yeah. Massachusetts. So there will be no slavery, which is different from England, mm -hmm. amongst us. Yes. But they didn't include those Indians or those black God, folks well, amongst us. us. Yes. So that's why there was slavery. Right. So I just, you know, what you're all saying, I just wanted to throw that out there. It's beautiful. Um, Robert Gould Shaw's wife was related to the Sedgwicks. Yes. And uh, Annie Haggerty, right? Is her name? Yeah, Annie Haggerty. Um, um, uh, the house still exists, and of course, Gould Shaw um, vacationed and honeymooned here in the Berkshires. Uh, so, um, um, didn't include any kind of 19th century uh, literary uh, 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 things of the Berkshires, you know, but the 19th century uh, white uh, male writers were gaga for Berkshire County, you know, they loved to to come here and, and, you know, go up to Mount Greylock and go up to Monument Mountain and almost fall over it because they drank too much. <laughs> um, you know, but they loved the place, you know, so uh, it must be something about it. You know, we can't get too many people here, you know, we could talk about always losing population, you know, and, uh, and some people think that's okay, you know, that means there's more for us. There, there, there's more for us in, in this kind of, kind of thing, so. Any other questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. Hello. Hello. I'm a history teacher of young people. Yes. 
<laughs> I don't know whether you, you, you should have divulged that or not. <laughs> I don't want it to seem biased. However, um, <clears throat> as a person who teaches US 2 and African American history at Taconic High School, um, my kids, again, when we're looking back, we always go back to look forward. They have a, and I knew you taught for many, many years, we're not going to say how many. Um, and so um, the dissolution of them, of things like figuring out that when people write laws, as Buffy Lord, the attorney just said, they write them for themselves. Um, this generation, Generation Z, has a hard time understanding historically how biased people are. They do not understand within the documents. One of the things that make my students the most upset was when they found out that purposefully within the Constitution, the word slavery and enslaved were never used because they knew in the future it would be looked frowned upon if it was in the document, right? And they're like, so they basically knew what they were doing was wrong, right? Um, and so when you were teaching young people about history and they have this disillusionment because they don't think, they're saying basically the same problems that we're seeing in the past where people only are doing things that are in their own interest, it seems like we're still doing today within our policies, like wh whether it be the, the rich or, or just us versus the rest of the world, we are supporting the things that benefit us at the end of the day, not the world in the end of the day, um, that we don't take. The big thing now, right, is that they got somehow on the thing about not having dental health as being medical health and saying we have this great policy of, because a lot of my students are in mass health, saying why do they not want to take care of people? And I said because we're a capitalist country and there's things that go along with it. So when you are teaching these kids and they are more disillusioned than not, how do you keep them optimistic about what is going to happen in the future because they are much more aware of the out groups the you know race class and gender that are mm -hmm. that are more have nots than haves mm -hmm. um that that's something that I've struggled with all you know my 40 years of teaching right um, and so I'm just really glad that I had students like Buffy Lloyd who continue to uh, soldier on um, but for myself, what I've always done is to take it from a smaller issue because when we look at the larger issues and we think we can never change that in any kind of way. When I came here, there was no African American Heritage Trail. You know, people didn't know about some of the people that we, that I talked about here today. And so um, I don't like to talk about my life as a legacy, but part of the legacy is that I've done a small portion of, uh, of, of educating and informing and changing the kind of dynamics of the place that I live in. And so if, if you can do something, just a small thing about the place that you live in, it seems to me that you're doing something better. It's the reason I like local history, you know, Abraham Lincoln didn't start as the president of the United States. He'd started that, you know, at this little boy in Kentucky, you know, uh, in, a, in a wood cabin and stuff like that. And so I, I want to know about Lincoln at that point in period of time. So I want to know who walked on this territory, on this ground, on this terrain where I live, and how I can make that better for the next generation. And so if I can do just one thing, see, Elizabeth Frick. If I can do one thing, <laughs> then I think that probably that I will have improved my life and hopefully the life of others who come after me. So. Yes. I'm, I'm thinking about your um, webinar for Souls of Black Folk. And I thought it was just, I, for me, I thought it was brilliant on all sorts of levels. But are you going to do something like that again? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, just because of bringing all those different voices together to address yeah. a text um, like that, it was just I, a phenomenal I, I, I said experience. this to what I say to my uh, former husbands. I move on. 
<laughs> I, I don't go back. I, I move on. Uh, uh, so what I'm doing now uh, with the Souls of Black Folks is trying to put together a K through 16 um, a guide for students and for teachers uh, to teach Du Bois' Souls of Black Folks um, in uh, high schools um, and have them understand uh, the significance of this man and, and what, he should, uh, what he means to us in the 21st century. And so I'm moving uh, more to that kind of, uh, to that way one way or the other. And, and you know, that's, that's the next stage that, that we're moving in. And I'm glad that people, I, I don't know who you guys really know what she's talking about. During the pandemic, uh, when I was on the board of the, what is now called the W.E.B. Du Bois uh, Freedom Center, um, we had uh, a 14 week read of the souls of black folk. And we took a chapter a week and uh, for each chapter we had a, a scholar uh, from across the United States come in and um, give uh, their take on that chapter and then we would have a, con uh, the scholar and I would have a conversation, then we'd open it up to the audience. It's on YouTube, so if you wanna go back and look at it, you certainly can. Um, I hope it doesn't date me, but <laughs> I'm a lot grayer uh, <laughs> uh, now, but uh, I enjoyed doing that and it was, and it was really, really great just talking to uh, you know, the different kind of viewpoints that people brought to their understanding of the souls of black folks, which um, um, is, one, is I, my favorite book of Du Bois is, a, is the Black Reconstruction, of course. And um, you know, doing Black Reconstruction as a webinar would be, oh, uh, marvelous. But you know, it would be a labor of love. I mean, it's just such a hefty tome to kind of deal with. But um, but the Souls of Black Folk is my second, and it, and it is a book of essays that I think can relate to anyone, uh, any American, if you read it. Um, and, and kind of look at it. And so that's the reason why we chose the Souls of Black Folks, but thank you. <laughs> Any final question? I know Roz is saying, wrap it up, Francis, wrap it up. Any final? Well, thank you so much for coming out. And <laughs>